found within a meter of where these orchids bloom. Right? And it's really cool. The orchids are pollinated by mushroom visiting flies, little, little fungus gnats. And so it's a little small, but anyway, this is the orchid. And here you can see a little fruit fly deep inside with this yellow dot. And this yellow dot is a packet of pollen called a pollinia. Right? While we're talking about biodiversity, in the course of this project, which was led by my, my colleague Tobias Belicia, uh, they collected thousands of these fungus gnat flies from both the fungus and the orchids to associate the pollinators. And they described 80 new species of fly from this project. <laughs> 80 undescribed species of fly. Right? But part of that project was also collecting some mushrooms and along with it. This is how I got involved. Uh, this was an effort led by Graham Dentinger and Tommy Jenkins. And some of you guys might know Tommy. Tommy's great. Uh, and it was, it was published in New Phycologist. It actually got a cover publication. Uh, this uh, paper on the mimicry system. And this brand new paper that just came out uh, about this mimicry system. So I encourage, if you're interested in Dracula mimicry, I encourage you to check out these two papers. It's super cool. So I got involved in these mushroom surveys. I'm not really interested in guild mushrooms. I'm interested in Xyleria. <coughs> Xyleria are cool. So this is, you guys might recognize this. This is Xyleria hypoxalon. There's one back on the table back there, if you want to get a good look. This is our most common Xyleria on the west coast and, and in, in North America. It's the most common Xyleria you'll run across. <coughs> In Ecuador, they're bigger, they're badder, they're more diverse, they're cooler. This is Xyleria schwannitzii. These are, these are four inches tall and about an inch thick, and these huge club-like things. Xyleria tuberoides, golf balls, just Yeah, so cool. Xyleria scruposa, because it's got scrupose surface. There's a huge diversity of Xylerias. And Xylerias, are the most common wood decay fungus you see in the tropics. They're one of the only ascomycetes that is a strong white rock fungus. They degrade lignin, and they do it in a different mechanism than most of the ciliomycetes do. They're really important to carbon cycle, right? But they're also really common ubiquitous endophytes. They occur as asymptomous infections in the leaves of pretty much every plant you look at in the tropics, and also all the way up here. You find the other areas of in duck fur, in uh, salal. They're really common endophytes. And so for me, that begs the question, why is a common wood decay, wood decay, wood decay, I can't let off. Why is a common wood decomposer fungus also a common endophyte? What's the, what's the connection? I think the answer is that endophytism can be used as a means of dispersal. And so this was a big chunk of my dissertation work. Well, here's, the, here's the idea. You got Xyleria. They fruit on wood. They produce spores on wood. This is Xyleria piculata. This is one of my illustrations. And then those spores disperse up into the canopy, and they create endophytic infections in the leaves. In tropical forests, leaves are generally evergreen. Plants are all evergreen, because there's no winter, right? The leaves are shed when they're no longer productive for the plant. Average lifespan of a leaf in this forest is about two and a half years, and they're shed asynchronously. So with a fruiting body on a log, you've got a really high density of dispersal propagules, lots of spores, over a relatively short period of time. Once they're in the leaves in the canopy, the leaves are shed one at a time over the course of years, you've got low density, but long duration. So we're diversifying dispersal strategy. It gives the fungus the opportunity to wait through periods where there's no available substrate. From there, there's a potential for there to be leaf to leaf dispersal. It's never been observed. I don't think it's really a thing, but it's possible. But really, once those leaves are shed, they become dispersal vehicles. And they bring the fungus back to the wood, where it can grow out, colonize the wood, produce new fruiting bodies. And then, of course, there's Spore to wood dispersal is probably the, the primary method of dispersal, endophytism being kind of a bet hedging strategy. And so we wanted to test this, so we went out into one of the permanent plots at Los Cedros. This is the actual plot that I worked in. It's thick, thick rainforest. It's a half hectare plot with 120 points. 
What you're seeing here is a representation of some of the environment. There's a little screen that runs through the plot. The arrows point downhill. The longer the arrow, the steeper the hill. The bigger the circle, the more open the canopy is above. This big tree fall right here, and there's another little tree fall on the far edge. So we went out, we collected every Silaria we could find. So this is me and my colleague Dan Thomas, our Ecuadorian botanist colleague Danilo Simba, a uh, duct every time we pointed a camera at him, he didn't want to get a picture taken. Uh, so, we, so we went to every one of those points, we collected all the Silarias, and we collected leaves off of the nearest tree. The idea being, that if on your grid you find Silaria A in a couple of places and Silaria B in a couple of places, and then you find endophyte infections of Silaria A in a few places and Silaria B in a few places, you can then put those distributions together and look for clustering. Because if the, if the fungi are using these endophytes as a dispersal vector, there should be dispersal linkage between those two light stages. Man, we found Silarias. Wild abundance. So this is Xylaria fissilis in its immature stage, Silaria globosa, Silaria telfarii, Silaria ianthovalutina, one of my favorite names, uh, Silaria atrospherica, uh, Silaria uh, scruposa in its immature stage, telfarii in its immature stage, Silaria schwannitzii, that big club-like one. And then we collected leaves to culture endophytes, both big leaves and small leaves. And we set up a massive culture project in the middle of the jungle. Yeah. And so this is our culture lab in the, in the lodge for rusting. You can see our one square foot laminar flow hood, our pressure cooker autoclave, our microscope, the culture is set up on the lab bench. All told, we ended up with more than 1,500 cultures, which wouldn't have been possible without the help from a dedicated undergraduate assistant, this guy Matt Davis, super cool. Ah, this is what Silaria looks like in culture when you grow it out as an endophyte. They make these beautiful concentric rings. Right? And then we also, in addition to checking the occurrences between the endophyte cultures and the stromata fruiting on the ground, we also wanted to check these environmental characteristics to see if there was any uh, correlation with the environment. And what we found was that you do indeed find clustering between the decomposer stage and the endophyte stage. There is clustering, so there's evidence for this dispersal linkage. We also found that there's no host affinities in the endophyte stage. They're using whatever host is available, which also supports the theory. We also found that the stromata vary with the environmental characteristics on the site, namely the distance to that little stream, but the endophytes don't care about the environment. They're in a buffered environment inside the leaf which also supports this theory. All of those pieces of evidence, all those pieces of evidence are on this side though, right? We want to link it all the way back down. So we took some leaves, we bleached the surfaces to kill everything on the surface, and we let the fungus grow out into popsicle sticks. And when you do that, Silaria grow from the popsicle sticks. They're very clearly able to transfer from the leaf back into a woody substrate. And all this work has been published in the journal Biotropica. Uh, you notice from the little thumbnail that we had a Zylaria on the cover. Cool. Uh, so if, if you're interested in that ecology, you should look that up. Ecology is cool. Also really interested in diversity. Oh, sorry. Uh, ecology is cool, but diversity is also really cool. And so over the course of this study, in our half hectare plot, we found 36 species of Zylaria. And there was a Xylaria in pretty much every plot. Really common. There's, for comparison, Oregon has three species of Xylaria, and only one common one. This Xylaria, which is not small, is an undescribed species. So we're working on a paper to describe this one, and we found it multiple times. It's relatively common at the site, but it's never been observed anywhere else in the world. And it's, I mean, it's hard to miss. You know, it's, it's red and, and beautiful and giant. Know. But then also other, you know, there's known diversity there. Silaria multiplex, common tropical Silaria, also beautiful. Uh, but this one, there's down by the river, there's this thicket of giant bamboo. Bamboo is a weird substrate because it's grass, right? Silaria is diversified with, um, like, with woody plants, with dicotyledonous angiosperms, right? 
So they don't really like gymnast bars. That's part of why we only have a few of them in Oregon. They mostly like hardwoods. This grows on bamboo and is an undescribed species. Cyleria telfarii is a particularly beautiful cyleria and does this really cool thing where the insides are full of gelatinous goop, which helps with water regulation for spore dispersal. Cyleria globosa produces these bright red exudates. It's impossible not to identify this fungus correctly when it's in its young state because of these red exudates, uh, which we think are involved in insect, uh, they're att attractive to insects uh, for helping to disperse these asexually produced powdery white canidia spores. And while Xylarias are usually black on the surface, they're not always. Uh, this is mature, you can tell it's mature from the black parathesia and the black spores collecting on the surface, but it remains white because it's got this thick exoperial coating the Xyleria kegeliana, which has only been reported from Ecuador once before. <coughs> this tiny Xyleria, the Xyleria tucumanensis, when you section it, this was the, this was the cover from that biotropical article. When you section it, you can see very clearly each individual parathecium embedded in the white stromata. Uh, this was described in 2014 from northern Argentina, and this is the farthest north record of this fungus ever. This little xyleria is one millimeter tall in its entirety. This is the smallest xyleria that I think anybody has ever seen and is an undescribed species. And so I'm, I'm working on the xyleria diversity from this particular place, but cloud forest habitat in Ecuador in general. And I'm working very slowly, it takes a long time, on a book on cloud forest xylerias. Uh, there are, from the reserve, right now I have records of 50 different taxa from cloud forests in Ecuador, it pushes close to 100. The world diversity known for Xyleria right now is just under 400 species. We got about a quarter of the world's Xyleria in Ecuador in the cloud forests. So you were only one here. No, this is, this is the diversity pieces across the 17, but it's across the 17,000 acres. Uh, but, you know, honestly, it's like within walking distance of the lodge. But so part of working on that is illustrating all these tasks. I think for, for these particular fungi, illustrations can be much more informative than photographs, particularly uh, when you're, you're interested in microscopic characters that help you identify them. Uh, so the surface textures, uh, the, the bases, the parathecial sections, the acai, the spores are all really important. And so I'm slowly working my way through and illustrating all of these taxa. But I should say this is Xyleria affinis pomosa, uh, sensual so. Xyleria physalis, you can always tell because of these horizontal constrictions in the fruiting bodies. Xyleria apiculata, we saw in the, the systems diagram, uh, has its apicula tip. This one actually occurs in California as well. It's been collected at the, uh, the fungus camp that Sonoma County Mycological Society puts on. Uh, they're, they're about a centimeter tall. Uh, the, the little scale bar on the bottom there is a, a millimeter. Xyleria uh, schweinitzii, which we saw some photographs of. Pretty smooth surface. You can't really see the swellings of the parathesia at all. Xyleria globosa, when it's mature, the parathesial swellings are really apparent. Uh, and it's got these exudates, which are bright red, which is going to show up on a black and white illustration. But this, so the, the issue here, traditionally has been these primary forest reserves, Los Angeles specifically, but also other reserves, have this issue where as roads expand in the country, that allows access for logging, right? And so as, and, and, and we should take a minute to think about, these are wet tropical lumber, about 12 feet long, three boards thick on each, each side of those mules. Each of those mules is hauling about 800 pounds. As well. And that is probably one tree that we're looking at in this particular shop. So people, people go in and they find the high value trees, they chainsaw log them, mill them on site into these big rough boards, take them by mule out of the mountain, which creates these absolutely ridiculous muddy paths in and out. Um, and that allows the land to be opened for grazing. Cattle is a 
big business, not just in Ecuador, but across the neotropics, right? And as cattle farming expands, there's a need for more roads, which opens more forests to logging, which clears the land for grazing. It's kind of a vicious cycle. That's been the traditional threat for reserves like this, is the, the poaching of timber, which allows for colonization of the land. But recently, mining has come to Ecuador. So this is a gold mine in Australia. Um, and you'll, you'll notice the semi-truck right here for scale. Uh, so I was involved recently in a, a paper that was just published a couple of months ago about the impacts of new mining concessions on biodiversity and ecosystem services in Ecuador. Uh, this paper is open access. Anybody can look it up if you want to. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea of, of what we're really talking about. So this is Ecuador. It's about the size of the state of Oregon. In July of 2017, this is the land that was available to mining activities. In July of 2017. In August of 2017, this was the land available to mining activities. The amount of mine, the amount of land available expanded by 300 percent overnight. In July, zero percent of protected forests were under mining concession. In August, 30% of protected forests in the whole country were under mining concession. Just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of what we're talking about. This is the iron mine in Carajas in Brazil. It's in mountains, similar amount of rainfall, kind of vaguely similar ecosystem. Everything you see in red here, here, these are the tailing ponds. This is where you process the ore with water, and the sediment needs to go somewhere. The water all collects in these big tailing ponds. And that sediment, it's not just iron or gold or copper or whatever you want to pull out that's in that material. Or does it come by itself? There's arsenic, there's lead, there's zinc, there's an incredible array of heavy metal contaminants in these tailing ponds. And for scale, this little square, this little square, is the town of Caracas, which houses all the mine workers. This is a town of 6,000 people with hospitals, schools, nightclubs. And it's a town that can be swallowed whole by the open pit of the mine. Mining in these lands is, is not gentle. This is, again, this is that, that open pit mine from Australia. This is the style of mining that is being proposed for, this, for, the, for the Andes in Ecuador. Uh, you might have heard uh, about the recent disaster in, in Minas Gerais in Brazil, where one of those palings and ponds mm -hmm. burst. This, incidentally, this mine was run by the same company as that big one we were looking at as an example before. The tailing pond burst. 206 people at least died in that disaster simply from the, the water sluicing out. This is a train track that was just swept away by the flood is a red emanation from the, the iron ore. The way these dams work is the mining company doesn't know how much ore they're going to pull out of a particular spot. And so they don't want to invest a bunch of money up front in building a really well-engineered dam. So they build an earthen dam up to a certain level to hold a certain amount of water. And then as the mine is more productive, they add another layer onto that earthen dam. And if the mine keeps being productive, they add yet another layer, and yet another layer, right? They're not engineered to hold, hold the volume of water behind them as a cost-cutting technique for the mining company, right? When this, dam, when this dam burst, all that toxic mud, 11 million cubic meters of toxic mud sluiced into the river, right? 206 people died in the initial event. Thousands more will die from the contaminated water that everybody there is drinking now. And this is Brazil, which is pretty, pretty geologically stable. Now imagine doing this in a place where, at Los Cedros, where I work, it rains about four meters, 12 feet, every year. And the return rate for magnitude seven earthquakes is about every decade. Not a great plan. <laughs> right? And so this is this is the map of everything in green is a protected forest, a bosque protector. Everything in orange is a mining concession, 
And everything in this red plum color is, a, is the overlap between those two categories. Okay? And for reference, that little spot of red is reserva lucidus. And people say, oh, well, you know, only one in a hundred mining concessions is going to lead to a mine. So, well, the exploration for these mines is not gentle either. You have to cut deep into these hillsides to examine the mineral profiles. And to do that, you need to bring in heavy equipment. To bring in that heavy equipment, you need to build roads, right? You need to build roads. And building roads opens the land to logging, which leads to colonization, which leads to more roads. Right? And the other reason that this is incredibly important, let's go. There we go. Um, this is the view from the lodge at Los Angeles in the evening. Um, these are forests that are in the cloud condensation zone. As warm air comes off the ocean at the equator, it comes up the mountains and it cools as it rises. And as it, as it rises, the moisture in the air condenses into clouds and then falls as rain. But as those clouds move their way through these forests, moisture is combed out by the trees. And these trees are covered in epiphytes. We surveyed, this year, we surveyed epiphytes in trees and found 60, 70 species per tree of different epiphytes. Bromeliads, orchids, etc. They comb the water out of the clouds. And the amount of water that reaches the ground in cloud forest versus cleared land is doubled. When you have forests, you double the amount of water that comes down out of the clouds. Without the forests, all that moisture just flows right <laughs> over the mountains. Which means that these forests are the source of most of the drinking water in the entire country, which is now subject to contamination by large-scale mining. And this particular forest <laughs> habitat is under extreme threat right now. Most of those mining concessions are within that forest zone. So what we're seeing here is everything in color is that Andean cloud forest zone. Everything in green is forest. Everything in mustard is cleared land. Everything in red is forest with a concession on it. And what we're not showing here is that the forest that remains is mostly not primary forest. Only about 4% of the forest in this zone is primary forest in Ecuador. 4%. It's been heavily logged out. Los Cedros is the last unlogged watershed on the western slope of the Andes in the entire country. Okay. And then on a, a more cultural note, these concessions disproportionately impact the indigenous people in Ecuador. So this is a Shuar warrior from down in, on the Amazon side. The Shuar territory is here. 90% of their traditional lands have been given to mining companies in concession with no consultation and no consent. The closest indigenous group to Los Cedros is in the north of the country, the Awa. The Awa people's land saw 70% of their land given away to mining concessions. Now, the Ecuadorian government has walked back some of the concessions on indigenous land a little bit since this map was produced last year. Uh, there was a huge march. 10,000 indigenous marched on City Hall in Quito. And uh, after sitting in for 24 hours, the president finally came out and talked to them. And he made some nebulous promises about walking back some concessions. And there's been no systematic announcement of which concessions have been canceled. But the, the mining, the Ministry of Mines maps have shown some of these concessions drop off. The Awa, in particular, are down to only about 20% of their territory under concession instead of 70%. So there is some progress there, but it's this, the communication around it has been poor. Um, even with the, the indigenous groups themselves, they only know because they're watching the website. They've never gotten an announcement that these concessions have been canceled. And the mining companies are still active in those regions, even though the concessions have so how you respond to something like this is huge. It's geopolitical stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and the way I know how is with science. That's <laughs> what I did. Uh, so we organized this multidisciplinary expedition into the heart of Los Angeles. Uh, we call it richer than gold, because gold is the mineral that the mining company is intending to extract from that region. The mining company is a Canadian company called Cornerstone. Uh, National Geographic and the American Orchid Society funded this expedition. We had about 20 researchers 
meets American and Ecuadorian. Um, and we went higher up in elevation than anybody has ever sampled within the reserve. To about two, the reserve, the, the lodge is about 1,200 meters, and we climbed up to about 2,000 meters and pitched a camp for a month in the mud. <laughs> and so this is this is the access trail to our camp. Wow. This is Dan and Ray. You'll notice he's knee deep in mud. <laughs> wow. But, uh, the, uh, even even the mules didn't much care for these trails. Uh, and this this is one of our uh, the parabiologists that works for for the reserve, uh, Martin. Uh, Martino Lando, who yeah, also the mule scare. So the, the hike from the lodge, so right, it, it takes, remember that it's like the bus ride and the truck ride and the three hour mule ride to get to the lodge. From the lodge to our field camp was an eight and a half hour hike in these conditions. It's only four and a half miles. But it takes eight and a half hours. Martin does it in three. <laughs> but he grew up here and he's also a beast. Uh, like a literal beast. <laughs> he's great. Uh, and there he's running the mules back and forth. But yeah, the mules, we had to, we had to reduce the frequency of our resupply runs because the mules were, were wearing out. Uh, and so this was the starting to set up our camp. We pitched our camp on a patch of land that was cleared by the mining company prospectors illegally. Right? They, they don't, they're not cleared for prospecting yet. They sent in a team, they cut a trail deep into the reserve, cleared this patch of land. We used the same patch of land so that the diversity we discovered would be directly relatable to the exploration that the mining company had done, and so that we didn't have to clear a different patch of land. And so we pitched these big tarps uh, with the center line. We dug, a, we dug a latrine eight foot, eight feet deep in the mud. Um, we took some breaks to look at some birds. The bird diversity is absolutely stunning. Uh, once the camp is all set up, this is what the camp looks like. Um, you can see here, this, this is Martin, 20 meters up a tree that he climbed on the vines of the amplifies. No climbing gear, no safety rig. We're just like, we gotta get that rope up there. And Martin's like, see? <laughs> he's, 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 yeah, a piece. Uh, the kitchen. <laughs> You know, we, we had we had a, a little propane stove, pressure cooker for beans. Um, we had a small gasoline generator, a little really efficient one. We used four gallons of gas, five gallons of gas the whole time we were out there. Uh, so my tent rained everything. We were out there for just under four weeks, and it rained at our camp. In four weeks, it rained a meter. So it it just poured every day. Everything's wet all the time. Um, but the view from the tent was really nice. Uh, and so we had, we had this big interdisciplinary team, uh, including entomologists. Uh, Jeff Grant, who's one of the entomolo entomolo entomological students from uh, SUNY in New York, also a splendid artist. Uh, she's working with Patty Taishan, who works on Labulobin alien fungi. This is her black lighting for insects. At night, we also did malaise traps to collect insects, specifically to survey for Labulobin alien fungi on those insects. We also get insect diversity at the field. Uh, Elisa Levy. Elisa is incredible. She's a lepidopterist and an Ecuadorian activist who started the Northern Ecuador Mining Observatory as a nonprofit that, uh, that like keeps track of mining activity in Northern Ecuador and opposes it. Uh, Sarah Wolf lives in Eugene as well. Uh, it's not all work. We had some fun and games. It's a ridiculous fruit cocktail uh, out in the field. I like so, the show you can be behind it. Yeah, love it. it's machetes all the time. Uh, this was our mycology laboratory, uh, set up just, just up from the camp under a tarp. We had a flashed together table. There was one big fallen tree on the site when we got there that Martin and his son Jefferson milled into boards with a chainsaw for us. Uh, you know, sticks slashed together for the legs, uh, clothesline. You can see the snap lock Tupperwares full of desiccant for, for keeping our specimens dry little dehydrator that we used with the generator when the generator was running, uh, tackle boxes on the ground, pelican case to keep things dry. Uh, we photographed everything meticulously. We have a little microscope. Uh, we're seeing here, uh, this is actually Ascopoliferus on a, on a bamboo. This is a little <coughs> precious fungus with a little scale insect at the bottom of that ball of parathesia. Nobody knows what it is. It could be new. Uh, but the real stars for this expedition, fungally, 
spider associated gourd snare described two new species of orchid from Los Dedos uh, that he collected in 2017. He would keep every year new orchids, uh, including an undescribed Dracula. So again, you can see that mushroom mimicking labellum. Was, the botany lab was in a tent instead of out on a table like ours was. Uh, and we wanted to be able to correlate the plant collections and the fungal collections to see if there were ecological relationships there. So all of our sampling is done in a quantitative <coughs> manner. The gentry plot, and so there's uh, five, we actually only ended up doing half the gentry because the terrain is absurd. Uh, but, so there's five transects and then meter square plots for ground level vegetation. And we collected all of our fungi in coordination with all of the plants. Uh, in the center of the plot, we had this, uh, this little setup with a tarp and a hammock to keep our gear out of the mud. Um, Tobias, the body lead, looking very typically wet and happy in the jungle. Um, all told, we ended up with almost 700 plant collections from this survey. Uh, this is out of drying uh, in Ibarra. And the fungal, this is the fungal splits. There are 300 fungal collections. They're in a box waiting to be sent to us in the National Herbarium in Quito right now. And we also did some local outreach. Tobias, who Spanish is a little better than mine, uh, was on local television uh, in Ibarra. Uh, and then the, the week after we came out of the field was the day that the court case for the action of protection that is the constitutional test. I think a lot of people don't know. Ecuador is the only country in the world that protects the rights of nature in the Constitution. Uh, and Bosque Protectores protected forests that right of nature should be protected. And so the reserve sued the government for allowed mining activity. That court case was the week after we got out of the field. So we got to go to the protest in front of the courthouse. The decision has been delayed. The judges are visiting the reserve tomorrow. Right? These protests were incredible. The community support for the protected, the protected forest is incredible. People don't want mining in their water source, yeah. right? The, 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 the closest little village to Los Cedros, just, just down the road, the way you have to go to get the mules, is this place called Magdalena. The, the president of Magdalena, the, the mayor, um, put in a, a letter, a, a friend of the court letter, for this court case against Los Cedros and in favor of the mining company. Right? Our people need jobs. Like, the mining company brings good, good money. When he got back to his town the next day, he was forced to resign because those it doesn't represent the views of the people. This is good. So if, if you're if you're interested in this, there's a couple things you can do to help. Uh, no no effort. There's a petition. The signing the petition helps. Uh, there's also a crowdfund. You can donate directly to the legal defense of Los Cedros by putting money into this crowdfund. Uh, the crowdfund is run through this uh, group called the Rainforest Information Center. It's an Australian nonprofit. It can be a tax deductible donation. Um, it's a little complicated because it's an Australian nonprofit. There's instructions on the website if you want to do that. Um, and right now, uh, Paul Gilding, who's the ex CEO of Greenpeace, is matching donations dollar for dollar. Uh, so money goes a little farther. Uh, and I, I should at this point, if not, oh, did you want to take a picture of this legacy? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I should acknowledge a few things. Funding sources. Most of my work in Ecuador has been funded through small grants from local clubs. Uh, so Cascade Mycological Society, my home club, Oregon Mycological Society in Portland, Sonoma gave me a grant, MSA gave me a grant, a small student grant. I had student support from NSF, uh, the University of Oregon gave me some money. National Geographic funded uh, the mycology portion of this most recent trip. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank the mules. The mules worked so hard. And of course, everybody who's been involved with Los Cedros, both past and present. Um, this is the 2011 field crew. You might recognize the faces of Vinnie Roy, Bryn Entinger, Tobias Polica, uh, Tommy Jenkinson, Jose Mitu, who founded the reserve and has been doggedly defending it since he left the United States as a draft doctor. The current field crew uh, is just an incredible group of people to work with. Uh, Danny Newman was with us. Uh, Jess Grant, uh, our Ecuadorian colleagues were amazing. Jorge Flores, if you ever go to Ecuador, I think you have a tour in this great. Uh, Martino Blando, Lisa Lee. Uh, Rosa Batayas is the mycological curator at the uh, National Herbarium.
Herbarium, um, and, yeah, everybody, Aurea, Sarah, Tobias, Dan, Aaron, Patty. Um, and the other people I should thank, we had a documentary crew with us. I think one of the, the most important things about this, this is a story that no one's talking about. It's like, Echo Road, it's been a year now since this mining expansion happened, and nobody knows it. Um, so National Geographic I just ran an article related to it. There was in the next valley over, Mandayaku Reserve is under concession to BHP, which is the largest mining company in the world, it's a Australian company. And uh, a group of American herpetologists uh, who are coming to Los Angeles next month uh, just described a new species of glass frog from Mandayaku that they named after the reserve. Mandayaku has it's a private reserve, not a protected forest. Uh, and they have explicitly told the mining company, you are not allowed on our land. Uh, and yet, the mining company came in and started prospecting in their land. Uh, and so the, the paper the paper describing this new glass frog is in open, it's open access, it's in PRJ. Um, and they, they use that paper as a platform to say, hey, this is a real threat uh, to, to rare and endangered species. Like, mining expansion is not going to be good in these, in these habitats. Uh, and so National Geographic just ran an article on that new glass frog. Uh, we're in touch with reporters from National Geographic. They're going to be publishing, right, as we describe new species and products come out of this expedition. Uh, we're going to come back in February. <laughs> this is brand new. Uh, but yeah, so now we are in touch with National Geographic. We're also, the, the National Geographic is not going to be involved in the movie. They've declined uh, to be involved. We are making a movie. Uh, with uh, <coughs> Dylan Sterwalt is directing. Solange Lopez is an Ecuadorian filmmaker, is co-directing. Uh, Clay Cruz from Walla Walla University is a uh, cinematographer. Um, and I'm a producer. Never produced a movie before. It's, uh, it's interesting. Um, <coughs> and it's going to be, I don't have any speakers that belong to my laptop. But we have a trailer uh, that we just finished putting together that I'd like to share if anybody's interested. Uh, and <coughs> we're going to be launching a crowdfunding campaign for the film on May 1st. Llueve. Los ríos crecen. Se desbordan los ríos como nunca se han ido. It's nonsense to do big scale mining in a place like this. We don't have much forest left. I mean, we don't. There is only, in general terms, there is only three or four percent left, which is nothing. Esas aguas se contamina, contamina el territorio, agua desaparece. Agua sin tierra, decimos nosotros, no somos agua. This, uh, this expedition is the product of lots of moving parts, lots of work from lots of people. Um, so we've got you know, Ecuadorian mycologists, Ecuadorian botanists, uh, Ecuadorian herpetologists who've all agreed to participate in one form or another to, to help kind of document the biodiversity here so that we'll, we'll know what we lose if a mine is opened or we'll have knowledge that can be used to argue against the opening of a mine when the time comes. que se haga la, la exploración para saber qué minerales existen, porque en realidad ese es el potencial que tiene acá nuestro país. Después del petróleo son los minerales que tiene. En cada asamblea salen las resoluciones negativas a la, a la minería, así que no a la minería. Las resoluciones están no a la minería. Y más, todavía más de los químicos nos contaminan, por ejemplo, las empresas mineras vienen a contaminarnos con la minería a gran escala. Entonces yo pienso de que eso es lo que nos enferma. Primeramente nos enferma la conciencia, que no hacemos conciencia con la naturaleza, no hacemos conciencia con la madre tierra, que somos parte de ella. Somos parte de vivir en un ambiente sano, libre de contaminación. 
Yo siempre digo, si Dios nos regaló esta casa es para cuidarla, no para dañarla. Y el hombre destruye al hombre. La esperanza que yo tengo es, si yo lucho desde hoy, dejo un legado. Lo poco que tenemos, tenemos que cuidar y tenemos que de entregar en otras manos. La montaña está como brava en este momento. Sí, la brava. No sé, ¿qué aviso será eso?